Sterlington. We're so excited that you're joining us today. I'm Megan Williams, the Children's Director here, and we want to take a minute, if you're a first-time guest with us, hit the connect link in the comments. We'd love to connect with you digitally. Hello, First Baptist Church family. Uh, I miss you. We miss you so much. We're so glad you joined us today. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, when we can all get back together and be together again and, and we can have those hugs. I miss those hugs from all of you. But we're glad you're with us today. And I'd like to pray for us if you don't mind. Father God, Lord, I come to you just praising you, Father, for who you are. Lord, you're so good to us. You are holy, 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 and I praise your name. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much that you gave your only begotten Son, sweet Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for going to that cross and saving our souls. Thank you. Father, I thank you for the, our church family, Lord. We. We pray for them. We ask that you just be with them, Lord, uh, as we go through this. Uh, to us, it's a difficult time, Father, that we can't be together. So I, I pray for our church family that you'd be with them. We pray for Ben and Cody and Megan as they continue to work here at the church, Lord. And thank you for all you're doing at our church, Lord. You're so good to us, Lord, and we, we trust in you. and. Uh, we know you're going to see us through, and you give us the peace and comfort we need. We love you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord, is it your grace? In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord, it's your breath in our life. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath 
in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise in your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only in your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise in your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. We pour out our praise to you only.
then I shall know in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul Savior God to me, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in today and being a part of Online Church uh, here at FBC Sterlington. If you've got a Bible or an app, I want to invite you to go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to focus in today on verses 17 through 24 and kind of continue our conversation about the, the new life of the believer that Paul has been unpacking for us in chapter 4. Remember in, verses, in, in chapters 1 through 3, He's laid out the gospel and how it has changed our standing before God and how it's so powerful that it gives us courage and life and it's the ability to, to just know what we've been given. Well, now in chapter 4, he's begun to talk to us about how that new life looks differently. That it's changed us, right? We've talked about that in the beginning of chapter 4. And then even last week, we talked about the gifts and how to every Christian, every follower of Jesus, that the Spirit gives a gift, at least one gift. And that gift is to be used to, to make the body of Christ stronger and to point people who don't know Christ to Jesus. And so those gifts are there for the bettering of the body of Christ and the community as a whole. So today as we jump back in, Paul is, is beginning to build on that. And he's, he's talking now about how those gifts are most beneficial when the life of the individual believer is characterized by this radical change the gospel has brought. That the more we walk with Jesus, the more beneficial our gift is to the life of the church and to the community around us. That character really does matter. That the way that we live, it, it makes a difference. And so look with me in chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. Paul says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, as you listen to that, you hear Paul begin there in verse 17 and say, I, I say this to you. And he says, I testify in the Lord, which means this is what God wants for you, church. This is what God wants for you, believer, that you no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Well, in saying no longer walk, what is Paul implying? Well, he's implying that there's a way that you used to live that you no longer need to live. Remember, throughout Ephesians, Paul uses that word walk to speak of the way that we live, the course of our life. And so here he's saying, I don't want you to walk as you once did. And then he uses that word Gentile. 
Now, in the New Testament, there's a couple of ways that that word appears. One is to represent all non-Jewish people. So you and I, probably the majority of us who are listening to this today, uh, we are, in a sense of the word, Gentiles. We're not Jewish people. But Paul also takes the word and he kind of expands its usage within some of his letters to the churches he writes to in the New Testament. And in expanding it, he basically says that the word Gentile comes to represent anyone who's outside of the family of God. Uh, We would say it's those who do not have a relationship with Jesus. And that's the sense in which he's using it here in Ephesians chapter 4. He doesn't want us to walk as we did before we knew Jesus. That he wants us to see that there's a way that we used to live that now those outside of Christ still live and that we don't need to look like they do. Well, what is that way? And why would it be such a concern to the Apostle Paul? Why say that? Why say no longer walk as the Gentiles do? Well, I think it's because you and I have a tendency to go back to what we know. We have a tendency to to go back to the familiar or the easy or the convenient. And Paul knew that for the Ephesian believers in their culture. Uh, It was a world that that was all about answering the hard questions of life. He he says it there in those verses, those verse, verse 17 through 19. He says that the Gentiles have a futility of thinking. Which means they think they know some answers, but their answers are all wrong. The, the Gentiles that, that Paul is speaking of there, those who are lost, he's saying they try to answer the hard questions of life on their own and they're coming up with answers that don't help and don't make things better. Questions like, what is life all about? Uh, why are we here? Is there really right and wrong? Is there a God? And if he, there is a God, well then what is he like? And their futility of thinking is coming up with all the answers to those questions and life is just chaotic. I mean, Ephesus was known for being a place where people just did whatever they wanted to. It was a place that was characterized by immorality and specifically sexual immorality. And the worship of some of the goddesses and and pagan religions that were there in Ephesus. Man, there was so much wrong and evil that was being done. And, And Paul says, look guys, you came out of that. Your thinking is not the same as it used to be. And so I don't want you to walk as if you can answer all of those hard questions on your own because something has happened to you. Well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let let me keep going because Paul also says that the the, the Gentiles or this this way that we used to walk, the believers used to walk, it was characterized by a hardness of heart. And in saying that, he's saying that there is a refusal to to see who God is. There was a refusal to even acknowledge that, that God existed and that God had a plan and that God wanted to be known, that he might have revealed himself to be known, not like the goddesses who were demanding things from the Ephesians, but that there was a God who had acted on the behalf of those that he loved. So there was a hardness of heart. So futility of thinking, a hardness of heart. And then really, I think if you were to characterize the the world around Ephesus in that day and age, it was really just an anything goes approach to life. Nobody could tell anybody what was right or wrong. That you could do whatever you needed to do to take care of yourself. Get what you want, when you want it, and your desires are your desires. So if you want something, just go get it. doesn't matter what it costs another person. It doesn't matter how you treat people or how you view God or how you view life. You just do you. And Paul says, hey, before you met Jesus, church, that's who you were. You had a hardness of heart and a futility of thinking and really... You lived life as if you were your own judge. You lived according to your own authority. And so Paul sees in the life of the church at Ephesus, those who had come to follow Christ, that at times there was a tendency for them to want to go back to that. Because it was just easier to to do what everybody else was doing. It was just easier to go back to what you were familiar with than it was to actually do the hard work of allowing the gospel to continue to change your life. Now we'll come back and talk about that in just a moment, but Paul saw that for believers there was always this tendency to go back to the way things were. I mean, in fact, in Romans chapter 7, Paul said about his own life that oftentimes he found himself doing the very things that he hated. And the things that he knew he should do, he just wouldn't do. 
So even in his own heart and his own life, there was this tendency to, to go back to the way life was before he met Jesus. I mean, think about those folks. Their whole life had been this culture of doing whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. In fact, it was what they grew to expect from each other. It was hard to trust people in that culture because everybody was always stepping on somebody to get what they wanted. And so they just expected that. So when Paul writes in the beginning of chapter 4 there and says, hey, I want you guys to treat one another with love and humility and have a bond of peace, man, that was different for the Ephesian believers because it's not the world in which they had grown up. It's not the world in which they had found themselves. And so Paul says, look, you're going to be different. But then as you follow, beginning in verse 20 here, Paul says that, look, it's not just that you have a tendency to go back, but the only way to fight against that tendency, that the only way to overcome the, the, the ways that you and I will want to go back to the way things were is through our thinking. And, and I would just summarize these next few verses by saying that, that Paul is saying that thinking drives direction. That whatever you and I think about, we dwell about, that becomes, the, or dwell on, that becomes the direction of our lives. And so Paul lays that out here. He, he begins to focus on the mind. Even in those first few verses we just read, he, he talked about the mind. Futility of thinking, darkened understanding. I mean, all those things have to do with what's inside our minds. And for the Gentiles, those were words. Futile. Darkened. They're not concerned with God or his authority or the gospel. But Paul says for the believer, man, the gospel has changed your mind. It's changed your view of God and of your relationship with him. I mean, look at verse 20. He says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. That's not the way that you are, you've seen the gospel work. He says that, that something's different for you. And then in verse 21, he says, it's, I'm assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him. As the truth is in Jesus. Now I know maybe your, your translation says a little bit differently there. But Paul's point here is not, hey, I'm hoping that you've heard this. I'm hoping this is familiar. No, no Paul is, is saying, guys, I know that you've been taught the truth. I know that you've heard the gospel. I know that you've seen the power of the gospel. And because I know that, I know that you have been changed. That you've been given a new life. And so Paul here is saying that the heart of this, that this new life that you've seen in the gospel, it begins with new thinking. That new thinking is only possible because of the gospel. I mean, you and I can't on our own see ourselves as sinners in need of a savior. Because we think we've got it all figured out until this moment comes where we hear the gospel and all of a sudden our minds are awakened, our hearts are open to the truth that we are people who are separated from the one who loves us. Uh, we are people who are separated from our creator. You see, the gospel, it, it opens the eyes of those who were lost in sin so that they can see their need for a savior. And that savior, that salvation, it, it's only made available through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And Paul says, church, you've experienced that. You've believed that. And so you need to embrace a new way of, of thinking about life and about what God has for you. Don't go back to the way things were because you can't. You can't go back because you've tasted what's good. That you see God differently. You see life differently. And so here as you look down, Paul gives us two ways that thinking drives our direction as believers. And the first way is really just what the gospel does to us. It, he says to, to cast off the old self, beginning there in verse 22. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. He's talking about what the gospel has done. It's this decisive act where the moment that you believe the gospel, that Jesus gave you new life and he forgave you of your sin all of it, forgiven. You no longer stand condemned or need to fear punishment or hell because Jesus has forgiven you and given you new life. In Galatians 2.20, Paul would say it this way. He would say that I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
Or maybe say Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, you hear in those verses what the gospel has done? It's changed your standing. It's changed who you are. At the moment that you cry out to Jesus for salvation, that old part of your life, that futile thinking, that used, the way that you used to walk, the sin that ruled your heart and your mind and your life, it was forgiven and it was cast off. It was put off. You're a new creation. You're something brand new. But then you get to verse 23 and he doesn't stop with just what's been put off. But he says now to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, here's the second thinking that drives our direction as believers. That you and I need to embrace the new life. That we need to surrender. Not, not just to, to what is ours because we've been forgiven and now heaven is our future. But that our lives right now need to be changed. And so Paul says to put on the new self. But he said to do it by the renewal of our minds. Your identity has been changed. You as a person who has confessed Christ, your identity has been changed. You are a forgiven son or daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're a friend of God, not an enemy of God because of the gospel. And, and he says that that is true, but you also are a person who is still learning to live as a son or daughter of the king. Remember, the goal of the gospel is not just to get you to heaven. The goal of the gospel is to make you and I more like Jesus. He's growing us. He's given us these gifts that Paul talked about at the end of chapter, or, or in the middle of chapter 4, for the good of the body and so that the community can know that, that Jesus is the one to be trusted and the one that can save. And Paul says that, that you and I need to learn to live this new life. And so it's a process of daily deciding to embrace the new life. To, to fight against going back to the way things were. And the good news for us is that, that Paul doesn't just kind of leave this vague and say, hey, I hope you figure out how to embrace the new. But he says it's by the renewing of our mind. And the primary way that you and I renew our minds is through our thinking, through the things that we dwell on. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul said, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That you and I, we wouldn't go along to get along with everything going on in our world. But that through the renewal of our mind, we would be transformed. So, how do we change that thinking? How do we uh, get our minds renewed in this? How do we learn to live this new life? Well, I think that the scriptures bear this out. You and I have to learn to lean into and to embrace the new life God has given us as revealed in the scriptures. The truth of God's word is our weapon against going back to the way life was. It is the very thing that is transforming us. And the more that you and I think about and know about scripture, the more that we act out what we know to be true in scripture, the more our thinking is changed and we begin to move in a direction that makes us more like Jesus. This week I was reading in one of our commentaries and, and the commentary uh, called the Holman Commentary, it says it this way, you are what you think. You move in the direction of what you put into your mind and what you allow your mind to dwell on. So let me just ask you the question. What do you allow your mind to dwell on? Are you a person who, as a follower of Jesus, finds yourself frustrated a lot of times in your life? Maybe right now. You battle with, man, God, where are you and what are you doing? And maybe there's some things happening in your life and, and you just feel disconnected. Well, what are you dwelling on? Can I be honest with you? That a lot of times for me, I end up dwelling on the problems in my life. I don't, I'm trying to answer these questions. I'm trying to make these decisions. I'm trying and I want to do this. Do you, hear the, do you hear my problem? It's I. I'm dwelling on what I can do. On what I feel like is right. When the answer is I need to dwell on who God has said that I am. I need to dwell on the power of the gospel. Now I need to dwell on who God has said, Ben, I am transforming you and I am making you into something new, something that looks like my son Jesus and brings glory to him because he's the only one worthy of it. 
I need to dwell on what God is doing to transform my life. That maybe all of the problems I feel in my life, maybe just maybe God is using them to teach me to rely more on him. And the only way I can do that is to press into his word. You see, the, the reason that, that I think that, that is so true for all of us, is it normal for you and I to trust God's word? Is it normal for us to rely on and to put God's word into our hearts? David said, God, I have put your word in my heart. I've hid it there that I might not sin against you. Is that true for us? The normal way is to do whatever you want to do and just get through life. But maybe for us as followers of Jesus today, maybe it's time to begin a new normal where we trust what God has said in his word. And the only way to trust it is to dive into it, to dig deep, and to allow it to be the thing that we think about because thinking drives our direction. And God's truth is the only thing that will help us to fight against going back to the way that we were because he's not through with us. I've told you often my favorite verse that he who began a good work in us will see it through to the day of completion, the day of Christ Jesus. So hold on, hang on, get into his word and see what he said about you and about himself. See the power of the gospel and then live accordingly. Hey, I don't know where that hits you at today, but I want to just take a moment here as we wrap this up and just say a couple of things. Here's the first one. If you, today you've listened to this message and you're a person who has never put off the old self. You've never had your sin forgiven by God. Man, today's the day. You can simply today call on the name of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, believing that he came to the earth and lived the life that you can't live. He got it all right when you and I have got it all wrong. Believing and confessing that Jesus died the death that we deserve. Our sin, our rebellion against God deserves punishment. It deserves death. But Jesus went to the cross so that you and I wouldn't have to face that punishment. And he rose from the dead to prove that he had done all the things that he'd said. And today, he's at the right hand of the Father waiting on you to call on his name that he might save you and give you the new life he's promised. That he might forgive you today. If you've never done that, man, today would be a great day to do that. You'll see in the comment box a button you can click or you can even send us a message, send us a text message. I know these are weird days, but the most important thing is not you clicking those buttons. The most important thing is you crying out to Jesus and knowing that he can and will save you, that you can begin a new journey today. So man, I hope that you'll do that. The second thing I would say is to those of us who are believers, man, are you embracing the new life? Are you digging into his word? Even in these days when things are so hard and so difficult, are you digging into his word and seeing what God has to say about you and about this world and about his work in and through your, you to the world? Are you dwelling on what he has said? More than you're listening to the news, more than you're seeing on social media, more than what your friends are saying, are you dwelling and thinking about what God has said? Thinking drives your direction. And if you're not, what, what's stopping you? What's stopping you? Well, Ben, there's, the Bible's intimidating, and I don't know where to start. Hey, we'd love to connect with you. If you, that's you, and you're just like, man, I don't even know where to start. You, you can comment here or send us a message. We'd love to help you get started in this. But for most of us, maybe it's just time we go back to what we've always known. That we need to get into his word and make it part of our new normal. Where we dwell on it more than we dwell on anything else. Man, let's step into all that God has for us. I can't wait to jump in with you next week to the next part of chapter 4 as Paul begins to, to lay out for us what this new life continues to look like. And he gets real specific on some characteristics and behaviors that you and I need to develop. But we'll only develop them as we dwell on what God has said to us and about us. Let me pray for you. And I hope to see you soon. God, thank you for the power of your word today. Father, I pray that you would help us to live out its truth and God, to step into the new life you've given us. Father, I pray for folks who are watching this video right now. God, I pray that they, if today's the day that they've never trusted in Christ, God, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would convict of sin 
and God would draw them to repentance that they might have their lives forever changed. God, would you hear their prayers as they cry out to Jesus to save them? God, I pray that that would happen today. Father, I pray for believers who are watching this and God, who feel discouraged and who have, God, tended to go back to the way things were, to settle for what's comfortable or convenient or safe. Father, I pray that we would once again return to your word as people who want to know you and God would allow your word to transform us. Father, help us not to go back to normal, but to step into the new normal of walking with you and trusting you with every step of our lives. God, you are always good in all you do. And Father, we tell you that we trust you today. In Jesus' name, amen. See you real soon. Thank you for joining us today at First Baptist Church of Sterlington for our online service. My name is Cody Keys. I'm the associate pastor here at First Baptist Church. And if something that uh, Ben said today kind of struck home with you and you would like for us to follow up with you this week, there is a decision card link in the description of this video or in the chat box. Uh, just click that link and fill it out. We would love just to call you up this week or text you or have a conversation with you this week um, just to kind of help you walk through uh, whatever you're going through. Uh, also, thank you, church, uh, for your continued generosity. Uh, I'm blown away um, at First Baptist Church. Uh, I know some churches are struggling right now financially, um, but thanks to you, uh, we were actually over budget for the month of April. You guys are knocking it out of the park. And thank you for your investment, not only First Baptist Church, but in the kingdom of God, in our town, in our region, and in the world. Uh, we love you guys. So uh, as you give today, again, that link to do that is in the description of this video or in the chat box. And uh, thank you for your support. And uh, we love you guys. We cannot wait to see you again. You guys have an incredible week, and we'll see you soon.